Okay, so let's get started. Um, hi everyone, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, today I'm going to talk about projects, more specifically about projects that have, uh, that have seriously derailed, that, uh, whose prospects look really bleak, and uh, basically I'm going to talk about how to put this project back on track. Uh, it's based on a real story, on a real project, basically the project I'm still working on currently is a GGRC project. Uh, it's a web application that helps international companies uh, stay compliant with every uh, legal requirements in various, various different countries they operate in. Uh, it used to be a Google project, then it started as a Google internal project, then they open sourced it. It was initially a Ruby app that was then rewritten into Python and the several themes have, cha have changed in the project and you can imagine that uh, once I joined the project that was in late 2015, the project was a real mess. It kind of can be described as a huge Jenga tower, you know, that big wobbly structure just waiting to collapse as soon as it touches something. Uh, it was really stressful work working on it. Uh, we were always late, missing deadlines. Things were breaking apart all the time because there were no tests. The code was, code was unreadable, difficult to understand. And one of the most telling facts of the end of, or observations was that uh, it's difficult. It took, took like three to six months for new people to onboard. Just think about it. Experienced engineers, very talented, and it took up to six months before they uh, became productive. As a matter of fact, the state of the project was so bad that it even made, that it even made way into modern art. Uh, you, probably, you can probably recognize this picture, it's really famous. Uh, it's a, of course, uh, it was, uh, it portrayed uh, an engineer just joining the project, getting familiar with the code base. Uh, and you can, it's really expressive, you can really feel the anxiety of that engineer. Uh, so, at this point, I would like to ask you, does anything of this sound familiar, familiar to you? Have you ever worked on a project like that? Raise your hands if you have. Most of you are here, yes, yes, yes. And By the way, was it fun working on such project? No? <laughs> didn't have fun, right? Well, we didn't have fun either, so we said that uh, we need to change something and make things better. But of course, because there are so many things to change and you, can, you cannot change everything at once, you need to prioritize and we, we needed to decide what to work on first. And after some debate, we realized that the worst thing that can happen is if those internal problems become external problems. And if you break user experience, if you deploy something that's broken and unusable. Because then the users start complaining, they complain to the management, they start questioning about the value of the project, and possibly even uh, uh, thinking about uh, stop funding the project and things, things can really go downhill from that point on. And because the verif verification took like way too long uh, to be sustainable, in our case, uh, we decided to fix that first and to prevent uh, divorce from happening. So the first thing we did was uh, we created a few, um, we basically we set up an integration server and we basically set up a few high-level tests. Uh, we call them smoke tests because you know they act like smoke detectors on, on ceiling, just to give you some early warning signs if something is seriously wrong. Uh, they're not that precise, but uh, they provided a very good good cost-to-benefit ratio. Uh, it was reasonably easy to add them, and they quickly covered a lot of code. So basically, we created something to back us up, uh, so that we don't really screw it. Okay. And with the safety net, net in place, we actually started uh, making the code better and more manageable. Mm. What you see here is an example from our old co code base. Uh, please don't even try to understand it because it was not designed to be understandable, and <laughs> obviously. And what we wanted to achieve is to transform the code base that looks like this into something that looks probably more something like this, something you know, shorter functions. Uh, easily understandable, uh, documented. See, there is a doc string de describing how the thing is supposed to work. You can probably use, reuse this kind of stuff. Um, so basically, linting has a lot of benefits. And apart of from, from making the things pretty, it can also cheaply catch a few bugs, like mistyped variable names, undefined variables, at least in dynamic languages. 
And it's also good because it improves code reviews. Uh, because then uh, if you have the linting checks automated, then people focus more on the semantics, not the style of the code. And it's also less personal. Uh, as you see, uh, some people get offended if you make like 10 remarks about the style and say, hey, why are you nitpicking? Stop blocking my pull request. But if a machine says, says that something wrong, well, nobody argues with the machine. They just say, meh, OK, I'll do it. I'll ma make everything uh, look green again and just do, do, do what it has to be done. So uh, because linting is a good thing, we, we said, OK, we devised a battle plan and said, around Christmas 2015 that, yeah, we're, we're going to do it. And by the way, uh, Christmas is a very good time to, to do such things because uh, the management ev and everybody else is too busy with having fun, enjoying the holidays, and, the <laughs> and they just leave you alone so your engineering soul can actually focus on uh, solving problems undis undisturbed. Uh, initially, we thought that this is going to be a pretty easy thing to do. We'll just run a linter, have it auto-fix the issues. But unfortunately, that thing failed. Uh, we then ended up with a huge diff uh, with some bugs in it. And we still don't know what, what the reason was. Maybe it was a bug in the linter. Maybe the, our code was so bad that the linter just said, OK, uh, no, I'm quitting this job. I'm not fixing this. Come on. Mm, so we decided, OK, this is, a, this is not going to work. We just have to do the things manually. But that failed too. And I'll show you why, because linting can be really tricky, besides, besides the fact that it's, a, that it's a really tedious work and you can get tired and dis distracted. Uh, there are also some gotchas, like, for instance, this one here. Uh, let's say you have a code like this that compares x to null in JavaScript. And then the linter complains, hey, you shouldn't be using the equal, not equal operator. You should be uh, using not identical operator. And well, you follow the message if you're inexperienced or not careful. And you fix the thing like this. But believe it or not, not you just introduce a bug. And consider what happens if x is undefined. If x is undefined, these two operators behave differently. Uh, the code behaves differently, uh, resulting in a bug. And the proper, proper fix is actually more complicated and it should like, look like this. So basically, we also, um, at the end of the day, we decided, OK, manual linting is not go going to work either. So what to do? Well, then we figured out that uh, linting everything at the same time will not work. So we focused on uh, solving uh, kind of a related but different problem. We've, we just wanted to assure that things did not get worse. A very simple, but yet really effective idea. And I'll show you how it works. Uh, basically, if you have a um, commit history like that, you have a blue uh, master development branch, and then you have a yellow topic branch, and then you consider merging into the master branch. And what you do is uh, first you calculate the merge base, which is basically the commit when, when you branched off from the main branch. And then you run your checks on the merge base. Then you check out, check out the, back the tip of your topic branch and run the checks again. And then you compare the difference. And it, if the difference is positive, you've just increased the number of issues and you shouldn't merge that branch. If not, then the check passes. Sorry. Uh, and an incremental approach like that really works well in practice uh, because you see over time the code gets better and better, the number of issues uh, decreases monotonically, uh, except in the case, you know, if you see there, um, that spike in, in the red line, that, that, that was the time when we just uh, changed the rule and we switched to single quotes, hence the spike. But overall, the overall trend is that things get better. And the good thing is that things are really feel, feel effortless in this case, because you're just doing along the normal work, and you mess up. You know exactly where, where to look for errors. And it, it does not block the regular work, so it also has much more support from the, uh, from the management. OK, so uh, we're doing pretty well now. Uh, we have a safety net to back us up. We, we are making our code more pretty. And the next thing we wanted to do, well, maybe now the next thing, maybe you can do this in parallel, is to increase the test coverage. Uh, so uh, the question arises, uh, what do you need to check in your continuous integration server? 
And basically, you need to check for two things. One is very obvious, all checks need to pass. And the other one is, well, you need to measure that you're actually testing enough of your code. You see, if you're just uh, having a bunch of tests, testing just one little part of your application, you're probably not, not doing as good as, of a job as you want, want to do. So, oh, 10 minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, but yeah, we're we are on schedule, so don't worry. Uh, so uh, my question here is, uh, what metric do you use, normally use to, um, to measure the amount of code that is covered by tests? Any ideas? How much code is covered by test? Code coverage, does it sound familiar? It's a normal metric, you use code coverage, and that's great, except for the fact that it's not a good metric. And I'll show you uh, an example here. Uh, here on the left, you have a code that uh, basically uh, checks whether x is equal to a letter y, either uppercase or lowercase, doesn't really matter. And then I refactor this, this code uh, into something shorter and more concise. And then I happily come push this commit to the, uh, to the server. And what happens? I failed. The server says I failed, even though I did nothing wrong. And I stared and baffled why. Because that work code is clearly better. It works because it's covered by tests, and yet the server is telling me that, that something is wrong. And that's the problem with code coverage, because it, it can result in many false positives. So instead, I propose a different metric to measure, measure it. It's basically the metric that counts the number of lines not covered by tests. If I push a commit like this again, the old value the old is 2, the new value is 2. I didn't uh, increase the number of, of uh, untested lines, and the check passes. You can probably see a pattern unfolding here. It's basically the same principle as we used with linting. You just focus on not making things work, worse, and then over time, your application gets better and better. And while we're here with the tests, uh, I just want to mention one thing. Uh, we, I mentioned that we started with high-level smoke tests. Uh, and it's tempting to think, OK, then we'll just replicate them and do a lot of high-level tests. But uh, you can only get so far with them. Uh, the problem is that at one point you realize that these tests are really unstable. They're really slow to run. They're not specific. They just, they just tell you that there is an error, but they don't exactly tell you where. And you can then realize that you're actually spending more time fixing tests than actually coding. So my recommendation would be to uh, write the, low, the, lowest unit, uh, the lowest test that covers the issue. For, for instance, if you have a list of items listed on a web page, and they're listed in, in incorrect order, and there is a bug in that little sorting function, you should just uh, write a new unit test for that function. If on, the other hand, if, on the other hand, the bug was caused by incorrect arguments passed to the sorting function, then maybe an integration test is more uh, suitable. Uh, but just uh, I want to say that there is a, the end-to-end -end tests are just not uh, the hammer that fits all nails. Uh, you can do better. OK, so now that we have a good cast test coverage, the code is pretty and more easy to understand, uh, then we can actually start refactoring and making it better. Uh, what you see here is a snippet from our templates. Uh, this is this piece of code is basically representing uh, uh, HTML drop-down menu. Uh, it's, it's, you know, pretty verbose. It depends on the global state. Uh, but it, at least it's reusable, you know? It, you can just, you know, uh, copy it and paste it around where you need it in a bunch of templates, and you end up with a mess. And if you need to fix something, you only have to do it at, at like, 26 places. So uh, you're used to that, right? But of course, uh, you can do better. So the way to tackle this is to encapsulate this some common functionality into a component. It's well defined. Everybody sees uh, that this is a dropdown. The the data is the point where data is passed in is clearly uh, it's clear. Uh, it was just by just reading the template, and this basically applies to um, all the other pieces of code, not just front end components. Basically, if you have a common functionality, just extract it into a function and cover it with tests. And if there is a defect or there is a need for change, you basically just need to uh, know where to look at and know what to change, and you basically limit the scope of changes. And the important part here, 
important thing here is that you actually break dependencies, that you basically break the big monolith application into small components. And if you do make a mistake, the changes, uh, the impact is limited. So one last thing I want to talk about is um, all, this, uh, th all these things I was talking about are uh, you know, more technical. But uh, this is futile if um, you don't have support from the management. And if you have to actively battle with them, whether writing tests and assuring quality uh, is a good idea, because they, in the short term, it's like basically a waste of time. And the management usually wants to pump out features. Of, and I realized that it really helps if you t somehow quantify the effect of technical debt. They, um, if you kind of, for instance, measure how much time do you spend fixing tickets, fixing regressions that could have been prevented by having more tests? Uh, then, and then it, you see that a statistic that like you're spending like 50% or more of your time just uh, cling after yourself, then management can actually understand that, okay, this is serious, seriously aff affecting the outcome of the project and the, the revenue or whatever metric, business metric that you use. Uh, so that makes it easier to, uh, to convince them to invest more time into code quality. Um, also, when doing estimates for the tickets, uh, you should really, really include the time uh, needed to write the tests and to assure quality into the estimates itself. Uh, a code without the test should not be uh, considered complete. Uh, you should, quality should not be compromised on. Uh, you should just say, this is, this is um, how much the things take. And otherwise, without the test, I cannot assure quality. And it's clear, I'm, for instance, when you're building a house, you cannot just say, OK, uh, some building that takes like six months to build cannot be built in uh, three months, because otherwise it just collapses. And if it collapses, uh, it's always going to be the fault of, of a person or, or a company that built it, not the person who's pressing the deadlines to say, how about just cut the corners, do something quick and dirty. And the same with the code. At the end of the day, it, it, it's your and only your, your responsibility as an engineer to assure quality and that the code does not collapse. And of course, uh, this needs to be a continuous process. You cannot do it, just do it once. Uh, you need to do it over and over again, over time, because the entropy of the systems increase. So you basically need to bake the, um, this kind of thinking into, into your uh, work process. So if I summarize uh, the main takeaways from, from this talk, uh, what, we did, what we did to, uh, to kind of save the project, uh, the first thing was to, to create a safety net, net to prevent the worst. Um, then we started making changes in an incremental way. So if we messed up, we knew um, where to fix them. Um, then we started breaking dependencies, breaking that big application into many smaller parts that are easily understandable. And we changed the work process to, to basically ensure that the quality is guaranteed by the very process. Okay, that, that kind of uh, concludes our talk. And for the end, I would like to make an announcement. Uh, the reciprocity, the company I work for, uh, is hiring. We're looking for talented Python JavaScript developers. So if you are one, or if you know somebody, please come to me, and we'll talk about it. Uh, I would like to thank you for attending this talk. You are a really great audience. So uh, it was a pleasure uh, giving a talk in front of you. So thank you. Uh, if I come work for you, how many of these problems do you still have? <laughs> oh, that's the thing I, I, I forgot to, uh, to tell you. but. Uh, much, much less. We have a good uh, test coverage, getting better. Uh, actually, the quality is dictated by the management, Google in, in this case, uh, because actually they need to report that they're higher management to, 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 to tell them how they will assure the quality. Uh, and so that's why we actually got a directive to write tests. It, it's easily understandable for A-level developers, but for C-level developers, you know, there has been a lot of argu arguing about it. But right now, the state is much, much better. So now management wants you to do all these things? Basically, the, they demand it. So the things that we were uh, trying to explain them for like a year and a half or even more, uh, it's now back in the process. So it's like day and night if I compare the state from today and from the, a year before. By the way, the guy who asked that uh, used to work on this project, and he's very familiar with how things went there. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions or comments? For sharing your own experience or view. I have a question for you. 
like who is writing like tests? Hands up. I write a double amount of tests. Okay. Uh, who, when you are like um, evaluating um, the estimates for the tickets, uh, how many of you are are putting also the time for tests into that? Okay. <laughs> Thanks. It was much worse, probably it sounds like five or ten years ago. Yeah. So yeah. people are picking up on this. So good job, guys. <laughs> yes, please. Okay, so the question is whether we try to use cyclomatic complexity to measure the complexity of the code and uh, try to reduce it over time. The answer is no, but it's a good idea. Um, except that I think that uh, a few linters have this baked in and the, you get warnings like uh, this code is too complex or too deeply nested. I'm not sure whether they're using cyclomatic complexity or not, but it, we kind of have some checks like this. But unfortunately, there's a few places I think the, the quick fix was to just disable the warning at that particular place because it's so messed up and no time to clean up properly.